Welcome. Tonight and throughout this series, we meet some of the extraordinary women and men who have shaped our country's unique character. Perhaps no country has been as successful in finding its strength through cooperation and its identity through acceptance and respect. For generations, we've come together, bridging cultures and communities to seek a more hopeful future for all. That is not to say Canada's history is perfect. It's not. There are dark chapters in our past that we have only begun to confront. But today, we recognize the responsibilities inherited from past generations and entrusted to us by future ones. We know our success is built upon decades of hard work and rooted in Canada's diversity. And we know that a strong, prosperous nation can be as united as it is diverse. I hope that, like me, you'll be inspired by these heroic Canadians so that together we can write the next chapter in the great Canadian story. We are explorers, risk takers, and dreamers fighting the odds in a land of extremes. Across a vast continent, we build a nation. Truly strong and free. One-fifteenth of the Earth's surface, inhabited for over 12,000 years by more than one million indigenous people. A land bordered by 240,000 kilometers of shoreline. The longest in the world. Majestic forests yield over one trillion trees. Two million rivers and hundreds of thousands of lakes. More than 20% of the world's fresh water. Water that nourishes nations. Among them, the Wendat and Haudenosaunee. Inland residents of the continent's northeast. Where we live and how we live with the land is how we defined ourselves and how we survived for years. I think this comes from a, a, the relationship with the natural world. Indigenous people are very much about relationship building. And they had very advanced democracies set up. Bison herds over 80 kilometers long roam the interior. Migrating with them are the Siksika, Gainai, and Pikani of the Blackfoot Confederacy. 4,000 meter peaks harbor dozens of thriving coastal nations to the west. This vast and diverse land will soon get its name. Canada, Ganada, is our word. The founding peoples of Canada are the indigenous peoples. At the dawn of the 17th century, worlds collide. The arrival of Europeans was the inciting incident in the creation of Canada in the story that we're living today. July 3rd, 1608. Month two of a grueling voyage on a French ship christened Le Don de Dieu. It's battling the Atlantic to a continent that Europeans call the New World. Born into a family of mariners, explorer Samuel de Champlain knows these waters. He's already survived two trips. Now, he's back for more. He was clearly a guy of immense determination and not to mention ambition. He had a genius for surviving. I mean, just able to withstand you know, journeys across the sea, which at that time were horrible. 
Champlain has petitioned the King of France and been entrusted with a mission to create a permanent trade settlement and found a nation. New France. Since Columbus crossed the Atlantic a century earlier, merchants have made hundreds of trips to trade with indigenous nations for fur and fish. But Europeans hunger for more. Europe at the time had been denuded of its forests, of its animals. It was exactly what Europe needed in terms of economic development and moving forward. And so Champlain knew that. Other Europeans have come and gone. Champlain wants to stay, driven by dreams of prosperity and a new start. Champlain saw the possibilities of a new world, not just the possibilities of timber and furs. But he was saying, we could make a whole new place here. Champlain selects a lush and sheltered site, what is now Quebec City. The powerful Innu and Wendat nations are skilled fur traders who dominate the region. They welcome ships as they come and go. The indigenous communities that were first made contact with were very open and, you know, rolled out the red carpet. Champlain will need his neighbors if his settlement is to succeed. Allez-y! But first, he has to build a shelter for his 27 men. In three months, winter will come. Temperatures will plummet to almost 40 below, trapping the Frenchmen till spring. These must have been immensely resourceful, determined, gritty human beings. And in terms of their physical ability and capability and survivability, nothing like the wussiness of our age. Vival, Natel, au travail. Relentless, Champlain pushes his men hard. He knows if his settlement is successful, New France could dominate the lucrative fur trade with the old world. A dream every rival European nation would like to crush. One of Champlain's 27 men is already in the pocket of a competing trader. And tonight, he's recruiting. Moi j'en ai assez. Qu'est-ce qu'on va faire? On va révolter. Champlain doit mourir. Demain. Et tu avec moi? Locksmith Jean Duval is the linchpin of an assassination plot. C'est Duval. Ils veulent assassiner Champlain ce soir. Conspirator Antoine Natel. Certain. Crumbles under pressure. If Champlain shows weakness, he will lose the confidence of his men. He acts decisively, charging Duval with treason. People may think of Canadians as mild-mannered. I think it would surprise the world to know that Canadians could be very intolerant of others and that our history has got lots of blood and guts and nastiness. But Champlain also shows mercy. He pardons the rest of the conspirators and secures their loyalty.
Over the next five months, Champlain's men used 30 meter walnut trees and quarried rock from limestone cliffs to create three formidable structures. A wraparound palisade, watchtower, a moat four and a half meters wide, and a line of cannons. It is the first permanent European settlement in Canada. Quebec will become the capital of New France, Canada's first fortified city. There was a level of courage that could only come from this fierce belief that this is going to work. And maybe not right away, but it will work. And a stubbornness to make it so. And, and the capacity to convince others of it. Well, that's the kind of people we're made of. But a handful of Frenchmen will not decide Canada's fate. That belongs to the people who have been here for over 12,000 years. December, 1608. Winter has come to New France with a vengeance. Champlain and his men face the prospect of death, locked in by ice and snow. Freezing cold and severely malnourished. <laughs> Scurvy sets in. Nature, of course, is the dilemma of Canada. The weather overwhelmed us, I think, really. And it would overwhelm anyone who lived here. Le 18 de novembre, il tomba une quantité de neige. In ce mois, un matelot et notre serrurier. Of the 27 men who crossed the Atlantic with Champlain just five months ago, only seven survived this winter. For his European colony to continue, Champlain must show France he can turn a profit or be shut down. His greatest hope is a precious commodity found here in the millions. The beaver. 35 kilos of thick, fleecy gold. Capable of changing the course of rivers, they will also change the course of our nation's history. I mean, it's just such an incredible saga to think how they found not spices and glory and gold, but in this kind of crazy little creature that waddled along the road, you know, with a funny tail and a cute face. And suddenly upon that little creature's back would be born the dream of Canada. Beaver pelts have been traded by indigenous nations on the continent for millennia. We traded often amongst ourselves. Commerce was something we knew very well and how to sustain our economies. The arrival of Europeans begins as an opportunity, access to the global market. The First Nations were partners, but perhaps the dominant partner in that relationship. It was First Nations which controlled the economics. All of those defining features of what was the early beginnings of Canada. June 18, 1609. Asha Stegwin, chief of the Aran Denrenon Nation of the Wendat Confederacy. Today, he travels to an historic meeting on the shores of Quebec. Asha Stegwin wants greater control of the trade routes along the mighty river we now call the St. Lawrence. The St. Lawrence was the lifeline between the ocean and eastern Canada to the Great Lakes, which then spread out into all of the canoe routes uh, right, across, right across the country to the Rocky Mountains. 
Chief Asha Stegwin and his people live north of the Great Lakes, brokering the fur trade through the east-west routes. To the south, a dominant alliance, a sophisticated democracy that inspires the creators of the U.S. Constitution, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. They also want access to these global trade routes. Our people reacted like you'd expect. We want to protect our land and our people and our children. And so often we did become involved with these conflicts. Doka, Dagway, Akuk, Dewa, Saste. To maintain his people's economic security, Chief Asha Stagwin grants a meeting to a man who has his own designs on the fur trade. Samuel de Champlain. When the French initially came to North America, they came in small numbers. They undertook trade on indigenous terms. Indigenous peoples dominated the relationship and controlled the terms of the relationship. They will strike an historic deal, one that gives Champlain exclusive rights to the Wendat fur trade. In exchange, New France will side with Asha Stegwin and his people in their fight against the Haudenosaunee. With a weapon none have seen before. The Arquebus. It can't match the accuracy of an arrow, but it can throw a bullet up to 1,000 meters and pierce heavy cavalry armor. Four weeks later, in what is now upstate New York, the Wendat, alongside the Algonquin and Innu, cross into Haudenosaunee territory. The two most powerful indigenous alliances along the St. Lawrence are about to face off. The largest fur trade on Earth is at stake. gone. All these things that were really foreign to us. It changed the whole whole life of the people of this land. It changed tremendously. J'ai mon arquebuse en joue et vise à droit un des trois chefs. Du quel coup, on tombe à deux par terre. So yeah, it made a really negative impact on our people. Could we have controlled it at the time? Uh, no. The victory forges a strong bond between the Wendat and New France. Together, they seize control of the St. Lawrence and a monopoly on the fur trade. For the next half century, over half a million kilograms of beaver pelts will travel 1,000 kilometers down the St. Lawrence and journey more than 40 days across the Atlantic. Soft beaver fur is easily shaped into stylish hats. 
which become the rage across Europe. France's economy is booming, all because of a weapon which upsets the balance of power among indigenous nations. With a new ally and a firm grip on the fur trade, the French prosper. But to grow as a colony, they will need a key ingredient. Women. The new france Wendat alliance dominates the fur trade along the St. Lawrence. By 1670, that monopoly is under attack. Another superpower wants in on the action. The mighty British Empire. The American Revolution is still a century away. Britain is aggressively expanding its colonies in the south. British settlers now outnumber the French 18 to 1. The British colonies in what is now the United States were expanding almost constantly. They were very prosperous. They grew at a pace that was much greater than that of Quebec. King Louis XIV retaliates with a most unusual tactic. He sends more than a dozen ships to New France, loaded not with cannons or soldiers, but with France's poorest women. You're really talking about the most um, vulnerable people. You know, poor, orphaned, female, teen. On this historic voyage is 24-year-old Elizabeth Aubert. She has left behind a rough life in a Paris orphanage. I'm sure the voyage was extremely difficult. They were all crammed in there, probably, slung in hammocks, um, vomiting over each other. It, it must have been just the most horrific thing. With no guarantee, no promise of anything, not even knowing if their life's going to be better than where they came from. They're starting over in that ship. Elizabeth and the others will become known as Les Filles du Roi, the king's daughters. Three months after leaving France, they finally arrive. One in ten will die in these crossings. For the survivors, this is home. It sinks in. They must now marry French settlers and grow families for new France. There's no time to waste. The process for finding a mate begins. They're sailing off into the unknown, but when they arrive... Bonjour, monsieur. Bonjour. They're presented, some of them probably, for the first time in their lives, with an actual choice. Supervising all operations is New France's intendant, Jean Talon, and an Ursuline nun, Marie Guillard. Avez-vous de la propriété? It was, I guess, a date with mortal consequences. It's kind of like suss out the environment and kind of go, okay, I guess I'll go with him. Est-ce que vous êtes religieux? Oui, bien sûr. Avez-vous des vices, monsieur? Uh, non. I'd love to imagine for Elizabeth that she was a dreamer. Suivant. Stuck in a bad situation, but had a, a vision of something better for herself. Bonjour. Bonjour. Avez-vous des vices, monsieur? Je n'ai pas le temps pour des vices. Elizabeth has met her match. Aubin Lambert, a hard-working farmer who settled here almost a decade ago. On September 29, 1670, in Quebec City, they marry. 
these women were thrown here into such hard situation and they had to really, those who survived had to be really, really strong. I see the women in Quebec and I think, oh, there's something so special about women in Quebec. So maybe it comes from that. So maybe it comes from the beginning. For her commitment, Elizabeth receives an automatic dowry of 50 French livres, almost $1,000 today. As a family, they can also claim a lifelong pension of 300 livres a year if they produce 10 children. And in 1689, Elizabeth reaches that target. They are essentially tools of empire. And man, they are doing the grunt work. France sends nearly 800 filles du roi to the colonies. The population of New France doubles and land claims expand. Babies are born at a rate that Canada will never see again. On average, five children per family, almost twice that of the 20th century baby boom. Today, more than two thirds of French Canadians can trace their ancestry to La Fille du Roi. It's a long line of people who have been rejected and who, or who had nowhere else to go, who came to Canada. That's part of our heritage. That's what we come from in Canada. That's what we are. But New France's population boom puts a heavy strain on resources. By 1650, uh, the French had pretty well exterminated the beaver population in the lower St. Lawrence Valley. So the best beaver hunting grounds are in northern Ontario. French fur trader, Médard Chouard de Grossier, and his brother-in-law, Pierre Esprit Radisson, search for an answer to the beaver shortage. Indigenous guides have sent them north to a remote Cree village. No European has ever been here before. By October 1659, after two months of punishing travel, the brothers reached the south shore of Lake Superior. Radisson and de Grossier meet Cree elders, carrying treasures that will change their destinies. Fluent in Cree, de Grossier requests a sample of the elders' furs. These unusually thick pelts are much more valuable than those left in New France. The elders offer directions to a network of rivers flowing into a massive saltwater bay home to a large supply of the most magnificent beaver pelts in the world. Radisson and de Grossier have just been given the key to Canada's El Dorado. But instead of saving New France from ruin, they change the balance of power in Canada forever. Three elders offer struggling traders Radisson and de Grossier a northern jackpot of the world's most luxurious furs. The men hope this partnership will make them rich and save New France's ailing economy. But this major expedition will be expensive. Going back to Columbus, Exploration was always fulfilling a commercial mandate. I mean, you know, we can talk about the spirit of venture, the curiosity that drives people on, but let's never forget that these were mercantile opportunities. Every single expedition had to have a patron. The Frenchmen rushed back to Quebec with thick, fleecy souvenirs, hoping to excite Governor d'Argenson. Regardez ce que nous vous rapportons du Nord. Qu'est-ce que vous en pensez? Arrêtez cet homme! Governor d'Argenson 
chooses not to help, but punish. He finds both men for trading without a license. He was annoyed with Radisson and Grossier for going out on their own and not immediately involving him. He makes an example of the defiant de Grossier. A few days of jail time doesn't stop de Grossier. It emboldens him. Devenir riche. Devenir très riche. Mais à qui est-ce que nous allons les vendre? The one thing that all entrepreneurs have in common is an unshakable confidence. They see opportunity where others don't. Every story you look at in this country is an entrepreneurial story. And that is the true narrative of this country. Driven by an unquenchable thirst for adventure and riches, these Frenchmen will take any risk to secure a patron. Even if it means making the long journey across the Atlantic. Even if it means siding with your country's sworn enemy. Gentlemen, we have a proposal for you. A proposal that could make you rich. 1665. De Grossier and Radisson talk their way into a meeting with the British elite at the royal court in Oxford. This was a time of dynasties. This was a time of monarchies. And they were the Bill Gates, if you like, of the time. And they, they had the funds, and they wanted to expand their, their empires and their purview. Gentlemen, with your support, we could make England the masters of the fur trade. What the Frenchmen are proposing is an act of treason. But King Charles II himself agrees to fund the venture. Canadians believe that they can overcome barriers either over it, under it, around it, or through it. They can find a way. And there's no question that Radisson and de Grossier found a way. 1668, the fur traders sail back towards their destiny with the fate of two European empires at stake. Cree elders have given them a map to a meeting place. But Radisson is forced to turn back when his ship is badly damaged. De Grossier continues on his perilous voyage. After three months, he reaches a saltwater bay the size of Western Europe. Hudson Bay. Named after explorer Henry Hudson, who died in these waters six decades earlier. It's teeming with wildlife. And home to millions of beavers with the thickest fur on the planet. Word of de Grossier's arrival spreads amongst Cree trappers, hungry for new customers. By spring, they greet him bearing luxurious pelts worth over 200,000 of today's dollars. The Hudson's Bay Company is born. King Charles II unilaterally grants it control over the richest fur trade on Earth. The Hudson's Bay Company will become one of Canada's most enduring institutions. But British land claims to develop on indigenous territory will create controversy for centuries. The English were trying to take over a lot more of the territory. And it was over our land, our resources, our furs. This is the part of Canada's history we forget. 
by 1759, Britain wants more than a trading monopoly. They also want New France. They go on a military rampage, crushing French settlements along the eastern seaboard. Their ultimate target is the fortress of Quebec City, the capital founded by Champlain 150 years earlier. And a brash young British officer, James Wolfe, is determined to get inside its walls. August 1759. For the last year, the British have decimated almost all French settlements along the Atlantic coast. And now, one of their most aggressive generals, James Wolfe, is set to storm the city of Quebec. An act that will put North America firmly in British hands and transform the destiny of the continent. Eleven thousand troops. One quarter of the entire British army in North America sails up the St. Lawrence. It is the finest armed force the world has ever seen. By reputation, near invincible. But the defenses that await them are more than formidable. Fifty-three meter cliffs the height of Niagara Falls. Shield a triangular fortress on two sides. On the third, enemies face a wall nine meters high and over four kilometers long. Its guardian, Louis-Joseph de Montcalm, is one of the most successful French generals in the Seven Years' War against Great Britain. He knows that if his gigantic fortress falls, French power on the continent ends. What Montcalm doesn't know is that General James Wolfe has a daring plan. September 13th, 1759, 4.30 a.m. The British begin a breakneck climb up the 50-meter cliff towards Quebec City. It's very important to use surprise because, for example, in a fight, what you don't see coming, that's what knocks you out. Uh, people think it's about strength and power. It's not true. It's about timing and accuracy, how to be deceiving. Something you don't see coming, that's what, that's, that's, that's what gonna get you before the French can react. 4,500 British soldiers are up the cliff and onto the plains of Abraham. Montcalm rushes thousands of troops into an unrehearsed charge. Wolf does the unexpected. He orders his men to hold their fire. The rash French volley mostly misses its mark. Division! Well advanced! It's Wolf's turn. While the French reload, he orders his men to arm themselves with two musket balls. Six. They'll have a shorter range but twice the firepower.
the tactic is brutally effective. They knew what their strength was. Their strength was British volley fire delivered by the soldiers who had trained in it for thousands and thousands of hours and could do it better than any soldiers on this earth. And when they delivered that volley fire, it shattered every enemy that they encountered. But Montcalm is no novice. France's indigenous allies honor a bond forged a century and a half earlier. Skilled snipers wreak havoc on the British lines. In a flurry of musket fire, a shot injures Wolf. But it will be the next hit that proves fatal. Slowly dying, he learns that the French are in full retreat. Now, God be praised, I will die in peace. Montcalm too has been hit. The most iconic battle in Canadian history is over, all in less than 30 minutes. Combien de temps me reste-t-il à vivre? Quelques heures à peine. Tant mieux. Je ne verrai pas les Anglais à Québec. By the following morning, Montcalm is dead. And his defeated army surrenders the city. After a century and a half, it will be the end of New France. French culture survives. But indigenous peoples will soon suffer a more devastating catastrophe. Some estimates 90 to 99% of indigenous peoples are wiped out by smallpox, bubonic plague, tuberculosis. I think that that's an important legacy of colonization to remember. The British colonies will depend on the support of enduring indigenous nations for their own survival. They must also win the cooperation of thousands of French Canadians. There was no way not to have a Canada that was complicated by all of those relationships. It's just a, a question of how intelligently can we benefit from our mutual differences. And uh, that is, of course, a challenge. As Canada nears the turn of the 19th century, our future will be built on our natural resources, a bounty of riches that inspires partnerships, but also triggers our nation's greatest conflicts.